Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Every Monday I bring you the latest news regarding the development of SpaceX's Starship program, all the launch events we saw from the past week, and all other stories that I thought were interesting. We have another jam-packed episode this week, from a fiery booster test, multiple Falcon 9 launches, an International Space Station resupply mission, Artemis news, and much, much more. Let's kick things off with Starship. Last week started off generally fairly quiet down at Starbase, but Friday marked the start of lots of Booster 9 testing. We saw a brief rotational test of its grid fins, and we saw the ship quick disconnect arm swung away and the chopsticks raised and opened above Booster 9 before the ship quick disconnect arm was repositioned. And so began the tests. Booster 9 loaded with propellant on the orbital launch mount ahead of static fire testing. Before the static fire test though, SpaceX still needed to conduct a spin prime test of the booster, which is essentially the same as a static fire test, except the test ends right before the point of ignition. After partial filling of the booster was complete, we saw the activation of the FireX fire suppression system before, there it is, the spin prime test itself. We're not sure quite how many engines were involved, but it certainly looks like it was a lot. In addition to booster testing, SpaceX also appeared to conduct testing of the ship quick disconnect arm. Here you can see it retracting from the Starship, if there were hypothetically a Starship there, but watch carefully, it looks like it now has a flip cover in place. This might indicate that during the integrated flight test, the QD arm sustained some damage, hence the need for a flip cover to be installed. But more obviously, the ground beneath the orbital launch ring was obliterated during the first orbital flight test of Starship. So as we headed towards the static fire test, all eyes were on that newly installed and tested water deluge system and water cooled steel plate as much as they were on Booster 9 itself. But SpaceX have done a great job with repair work and the ground around the steel plate and deluge system is looking complete. And last week we also saw ongoing work adjacent to the launch pad with the pouring of more concrete on the former landing site to accommodate the arrival of more propellant tanks for the tank farm. So that's pretty much where SpaceX are with the launch pad ground. But enough about ground news, let's talk about Ground News, the sponsor of today's video. In today's media landscape, staying informed and finding reliable news can be a real challenge. The rise of digital media and ad-driven algorithms have led to sensationalized and often misleading content. Founded by a former NASA engineer, Ground News is a website and app designed to give you a comprehensive view of the world's news so that you can truly see the full picture. Let me show you how it works. Ground News gives you a visual breakdown of each story, including which outlets and their owners are reporting it and what their political biases are, as well as the factual accuracy of their sources. You can also compare the headlines for every article for a given issue and read the articles in full. You can even follow the topics you care about the most, from space exploration to tech news. And Ground News' blind spot feed lets you discover stories that might be ignored by one side of the political spectrum. Using Ground News is great. It makes reading the news easier and more enjoyable and allows me to quickly drill down into a story to find out what's really going on. So if you're tired of the noise and crave reliable news that keeps you actually informed, give Ground News a try. Go to ground.news slash loun or click the link in the description below to download for free or subscribe using my link to get 30% off. It's time to take control of your news and Ground News is here to guide you on that journey. Stay informed, stay curious, and stay grounded with Ground News. Anyway, with its spin prime test completed, it was time for the main event, multiple engine static fire, which would be as much a test of the newly installed water deluge system as it would have been for Booster 9. Tensions were high as we watched the live stream count down to zero, and then there it is in its full glory. Gotta love these drone shots from SpaceX. This looks really impressive, and it does look like, as the water begins to settle, that the deluge system and the water-cooled steel plate held up okay to the power of the Super Heavy. Here's a video SpaceX released on their Twitter, sorry, X video feed, showing the test in real time with glorious sound. But 
But how successful was the test? Well, it's still only been about a day since it happened, so confirmed information is still a bit thin on the ground. But what we do know is that the test was targeted to last 5 seconds, but only lasted 2.74 seconds, and 4 Raptor 2 engines shut down prematurely. As for the Delu system, it's deactivated and seems relatively unharmed. No grass fires were started thanks to the water deluge, and Booster 9 detanked and depressurized okay. According to SpaceX, Starship Super Heavy can launch with up to three engines inactive, so the failure of the fourth engine could well have triggered the abort for this test. What do you think? If you have your own theories or thoughts on the Booster 9 static fire, then be sure to leave them down below. And hey, while you're down there, if you are enjoying the video so far, then don't forget to drop a like down there. Always helps me out. <laughs> so what's next for Booster 9? Earlier today, we saw two self-propelled modular transporters with booster couplers and counterweights being transported to the launch pad, indicating a booster rollback will be taking place shortly. This might be a bad thing. If there's something wrong with Booster 9 that caused the test to be cut short, repairs could take a while. But then again, Booster 9 was always going to need to return to the build site at some point, because before the next orbital launch, it'll need to be fitted with its hot staging ring. The hot stage ring prototype has been preparing for testing down at the Macy's test site, next to Ship 28. It was firstly placed on the Can Crusher rig's base, and we briefly saw the hot staging ring itself removed from the rest of the tank and placed on the ground before being raised and refitted, perhaps as a final inspection before testing. Remember, this thing is going to have to support a huge amount of stress during the launch, while at the same time having enough holes to allow the exhaust from the second stage to dissipate away from the top of the booster. A very fine line to balance. The next day, the simulated ship aft skirt section was lifted onto the vent ring before finally being topped off with the top of the can crusher rig. This was then attached to the bottom of the can crusher rig with cables, which will then try and pull the two sections together, crushing the test tank to see if it can withstand the necessary forces that it'll be subjected to during flight. Prior to the crush test, the neighbouring Ship 28 was staged for rollback and loaded onto a transporter module before being moved to the production site, having completed its cryoproofing test campaign. We've been seeing the buildings of Starbase continue to evolve as well. Mega Bay 2 is rapidly approaching completion, the Star Factory expansion continues, and the relocation of the ground fabrication building is steaming ahead. New vehicle progress also continues. Over the course of the week, we've seen the moving of ring sections for Ship 30 into the high bay. In this shot, you can see its common dome heading into the high bay as this prototype continues to rise. SpaceX were also seen to be dismantling one of the tracking dishes at Starbase, either due to it no longer being needed, or so that it could be disassembled and then reassembled somewhere else. One notable anniversary we had last week was that yesterday, Sunday the 6th of August, marked the two-year anniversary of the very first stack of Starship and Super Heavy, with the mating of Booster 4 and Ship 20. It's amazing how fast time flies, and how these two prototypes didn't, <laughs> and how far the Starship program has come since then. SpaceX conducted a couple of Falcon 9 launches towards the end of last week. The first was on Thursday the 3rd of August, and for this launch, the Falcon 9 carried the Intelsat Galaxy 37 satellite to geosynchronous orbit. Following stage separation, the first stage of this Falcon 9 successfully landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean, bringing an end to this particular booster, B-1077's sixth overall mission. Intelsat Galaxy 37 was successfully deployed into a geosynchronous transfer orbit approximately 32 minutes after launch, and when operations start later this year, it'll deliver a wide range of communication services and coverage to North America. The other Falcon 9 launch we saw last week took place in the early hours of today. This time the mission was Starlink Group 6-8. The Falcon 9 carried 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites up to Starlink Shell 6 in low Earth orbit, and shortly following stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage booster successfully landed on the shortfall of Gravitas drone ship, again stationed in the Atlantic Ocean, wrapping up this booster's fourth overall flight. Falcon 9 wasn't the only bird in the sky last week, we also saw two other orbital rocket launches. The first launch was from China's Qiquan Satellite Launch Center on Thursday. Here, we saw a Long March 4C carrying the Fengyang 3F satellite to low Earth orbit. The satellite weighs around 2.7 metric tons and is equipped with 10 instruments that will provide data about 
according to official sources, global ozone distribution, ice and snow cover, sea surface temperature, remote sensing information needed for short-term climate prediction and climate change prediction, and greatly improved the observation of the vertical profile of atmospheric temperature and humidity. It was successfully placed into an 830km sun-synchronous Earth orbit. The other launch we saw last week was an Antares 230 Plus from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport in the US on Wednesday. The primary payload for this mission was the Cygnus NG-19 spacecraft, an autonomous International Space Station resupply vehicle carrying around 3.5 metric tons of cargo to the station, including crew provisions, new science payloads, and space parts for future space station maintenance. And wait a second, does NASA pirate Windows 10? <laughs> anyway, on Friday, the spacecraft was captured with the International Space Station's robotic Canadarm2 by NASA astronauts Woody Hoberg and Frank Rubio, and it was then subsequently berthed to the Earth-facing port of the International Space Station's Unity module. In Artemis news now, technicians at NASA's Mishu Assembly in New Orleans have lifted the intertank of the SLS core stage for NASA's upcoming Artemis 3 mission to move it to another location in the factory for further inspection and production. The intertank acts as the backbone of the rocket's core stage, situated between the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen tanks. Besides connecting the two propellants tanks, it also houses avionics and electronics and serves as an attachment point for the rocket's solid rocket boosters. Artemis 1 was definitely one of the best launches of 2022, and it's very exciting to see NASA diligently work on the next in line rockets. But that's all from me this week. I hope you enjoyed this week's Space News and Starship Rundown. And of course, huge thanks are owed to my Patreon supporters and my YouTube channel members. Their names can be seen listed on the left of the screen there. There should also be two other videos from my channel that you should think you'll like. Hopefully they look interesting to you. And of course, don't forget to check out Ground News, the sponsor of today's video, and the best way to see every side of every story. Thanks for watching, everyone, and I'll catch you in the next one.